La Prospect Hydro Hernia Repair has a recurrence rate that can reach 66%. Mesh reinforcement for crew repair may reduce such risk. Complications related to prosthetic hydroplasty for hydro hernia repair are more common than previously reported. The aim of this video is to discuss four emblematic complications related to the use of both synthetic and biological mesh hydro reinforcement. The first case is that of a 60-year-old patient who presented with severe dysphagia, chronic cuffing and reflux symptoms one year after a redo Nysen fund application with prosthetic cruel repair for recurrent GERD and four months after a first fund application. A keyhole double-sided composite polypropylene silicon mesh had been used. The contrast swallow exam revealed a major stenosis of the esophagus in the gastroesophageal junction and proximal dilatation associated with important reflux. At reoperation, a significant fibrosis with a substantial esophageal stenosis are found at the hiatus. The first step is to remove the mesh in order to free the esophagus and enlarge the hiatal orifice. Subsequently, the previous fund application is progressively taken down with careful dissection by means of scissors as well as a vessel sealing device in order to restore a normal anatomy, but also to preserve major structures such as vagus nerves. A simple crew of plasty using non-absorbable sutures is then performed making sure not to strangulate the esophagus by approaching the crura. Subsequently, a short floppy Nysen fund application is performed. At the end of the procedure, an absorbable vicral mesh is placed around the esophagus without any fixation in order to prevent early intrathoracic valve migration. The patient is symptom free at 8 months. A 70 year old man presented with a new onset of dysphagia and weight loss 7 months after a Nysen Rossetti fund application with hiatal hernia prosthetic mesh repair. A double sided composite polypropylene collagen mesh was used. Esophageal gastroduodenoscopy showed a mesh erosion into the esophageal wall at the gastroesophageal junction with an almost total esophageal obstruction. The mesh was grasped with a foreign body forceps and secured with a polypectomy snare. Strong traction in retroflexion allowed to remove most of the mesh. Fluoroscopy showed a small periesophageal cavity which was not communicating with the mediastinum. A 12 cm by 22 mm covered self-expanding metal stent was delivered to seal the cavity and to prevent stenosis. After a normal swallow study performed the next day, the patient resumed a liquid diet and was discharged. Five weeks later, a new endoscopy control was performed and the stent was removed. A decreased residual cavity persisted. This finding was also confirmed by perioperative fluoroscopy. A new stent was placed for five additional weeks. At removal, there was no stricture and no residual cavity. No leakage was detected in the fluoroscopy. Surveillance was decided upon and the patient underwent an endoscopy control at three months. No esophageal stricture was detected and mucosal healing was satisfying. The patient is symptom free one year later. The third case is that of a 61 year old woman who presented to the emergency department for an incarcerated type 3 hiatal hernia. A laparoscopic treatment was decided upon as an emergency procedure. During the operation, dense adhesions and inflammation were found while dissecting the hernia sac. Despite difficult dissection, special attention was paid to preserve the anterior and posterior vagus nerve. Subsequently, a cruroplasty was made using non-absorbable sutures at the anterior and posterior side of the hiatus, taking care not to produce any stenosis on the esophagus. A U-shaped biological mesh reinforcement was placed at the posterior surface of the hiatus, which was fixed using two simple sutures. Finally, 
a laparoscopic partial posterior frontal plication was performed. Five months later, the patient consulted for severe persistent dysphagia. A swallow gastrographin test revealed a stenosis of the gastroesophageal junction associated with severe dilatation of the esophagus. At reoperation, severe scarring was found around the esophagus with a narrowing of the G junction due to a fibrotic ring. A meticulous dissection allowed to free the esophagus and divide the ring. A perioperative gastroscopy ruled out any other lesions and confirmed a correct esophageal caliber. No further intervention was decided upon. The postoperative outcome was uneventful. At five years of follow-up, a significant improvement in clinical signs is observed, although persisting dysphagia is present. The fourth case is that of a 50-year-old woman who presented with severe dysphagia and important weight loss one year after an open redo nisen front application for recurrent GERD and paraesophageal hernia. A prosthetic cruel repair was performed using a polypropylene mesh. At reoperation, a severe esophageal stenosis and angulation were found arising from the keyhole-shaped polypropylene mesh with pseudodiverticular dilatation of the distal esophagus. Removal of the mesh was difficult since the prosthetic material was embedded into the esophageal wall. The mesh was finally partially removed in small pieces and the esophagus could eventually be freed. An area of 2 cm of esophageal mucosa was left exposed. For this reason, in order to prevent esophageal dilatation over time, it was decided to extend the myotomy distally under endoscopic control, excluding any perforation. The post-operative course was uneventful. At six years of follow-up, there is a significant improvement in clinical signs, although persisting dysphagia is still occasionally present. To conclude, mesh reinforcement may reduce but not suppress the risk of recurrence in the setting of large paraesophageal hernias, and it is obviously not the only factor responsible for recurrence. In addition, meshes can lead to significant complications with devastating consequences.